Good morning, church. Today's scripture reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. It reads, And I, when I came to you, brothers and sisters, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Well, hello there, New King Church. Uh, Pastor Aaron Clark here. As you can tell, I'm not in the barn house where I normally am, or even in Cape Cod. I'm right here in the church, in the foyer, actually, of the church, or the foyer, as uh, some of the more fancy folk call it. And uh, you can see the resource center behind me that we used to use, no longer being used. But feel free to buy books by, from there, by the way, or just take them for free. Um, I was not told that I could say that, but I just said it. So um, maybe take advantage of that. Uh, anyway, so I wanted to start off by saying that uh, as pastors of New King, uh, we've been grasping for answers on what exactly it is that God's calling us to do uh, and who to be in these crazy, crazy times. And I think that there's a lot of you who are all thinking through the same things. Um, and Ben, he opened up that conversation last week by helping us to understand what's going on with the world we're in and challenging us to respond in love. Well, we want to continue thinking through that and praying about what and who uh, God is calling us to be and one thing that the Lord keeps putting on our hearts is unity. And we're talking about unity on so many levels. Uh, unity between our eldership team, unity between individual Christians, unity as a church, unity as a collective of churches in Burlington, uh, unity between believers with different giftings, and unity between diverse people groups. Obviously, that last one being pretty relevant to um, our national discussion right now. Uh, so I hope that you'll engage and that you'll join us uh, as we seek unity together. Now, we could have started with the question, is unity possible? And it might surprise you to hear that the answer to that would be no. <laughs> Not humanly speaking, anyway. Uh, it is impossible with man, as are most things, uh, but is the great truth of our faith that what is impossible with man is made possible with God. So God makes unity possible. It's true. But I wanted to skip ahead to just how God makes it possible. So that's why we're asking the question today, how is unity possible? And I won't keep you in suspense for an answer. I just want to give it away so that you can start to begin to grasp this answer. Here it is. God's gifts are enough for unity between all peoples. God's gifts are enough for unity between all peoples. So let me break that down. Uh, first of all, I, I could have said something else. There's a lot of different things I could have said. I could have said God's grace is enough for unity between all peoples. It's the same idea, but I wanted us to think about the specific gifts that God has given us to make unity happen. I could have also said God's gift, uh, uh, gifts are enough for peace between all peoples. Uh, but I wanted to make it clear, this isn't just a lay down your arms and stop fighting kind of piece. This is deeper than that. Uh, this is becoming one, right? So true unity. And I also could have said God's gifts are um, enough for unity, period. But I wanted to make it clear that this is all inclusive. There is no division that can't be healed by the gifts of God. I could have also said um, that these gifts... Uh, well, uh, sorry, I don't know what I'm saying. I also uh, just wanted to make it clear that these gifts are, uh, that they're, they're enough and that they're sufficient, which by the way, when I say that word enough, sometimes I say enough th -th -th with a TH sound. So I hope that you'll forgive me, that you'll just ignore that and move on. It's some weird thing I picked up. I don't know where I picked it up. But the point is, I wanted to make it clear that these gifts are enough uh, to make it clear that um, you have to use these gifts, actually. Um, you can't fall short of them and hope to achieve unity, and you don't need to go beyond them. They are enough. They are sufficient. 
So uh, God has given us the perfect gifts. We need to see this work of unity complete. God's gifts are enough for unity between all peoples. So what are his gifts? So three that I want to talk about today. The gift of God's word, his testimony. The gift of Christ, his son. And the gift of the Holy Spirit, his energy. All right, so before we break those down, let's just ask the word, uh, the word. Let's ask God uh, to guide our time. Uh, Father, Heavenly Father, would you just teach our church to testify your word? Would you teach us to live in the work and the person of Christ? Would you teach us to toil with all of the energy that you so powerfully provide? I pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Um, So looking at our text, uh, you may be thinking, this doesn't really talk about unity. Uh, You're right. It doesn't talk about it directly. And that's not the main point I wanted to draw out of the text I wanted to show that Paul considered these gifts of God that we're talking about today um, to be enough, to be sufficient. Paul didn't feel the need to rely on anything else. And if they were enough for Paul, they're enough for our purposes. So the first gift is the gift of God's testimony. It is the sufficient communication on unity between all peoples. So look at verse 1 of our text. It says this, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. That was 1 Corinthians 2, verse 1. So when Paul came to the Corinthians, he made sure to only proclaim to them what he had heard and seen from God, the testimony of God. Now, that might sound familiar to you because that's exactly how Jesus came to the earth. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. John 3, 32. The gift of God's testimony is the sufficient communication on unity between all peoples. The Christian bears witness to what he has seen and heard from God, but not everyone receives God's testimony as sufficient. In fact, no one received Christ's testimony, as we just heard from that verse. What would people rather listen to? Well, anything else, really. But Jesus said to the Pharisees of his day, I speak of what I have seen in the presence of the Father, and you do what you have heard from your Father. Asked him who their Father was, and he says, Satan. And that's John eight thirty eight. The problem with the Pharisees was that they had become more keen observers of their traditions and of the written law and the word of God. It's a bit like our times in some ways. Obviously, most people would rather hear anything but the testimony of God, but some people would recommend to you as your primary source books other than the word of God. So if you've been around, for example, uh, race conversations long enough, you've probably been told something like this that I've heard many times. Uh, You have to read this book or that book, whatever book it is, some sociology book or other that's going to lift the veil, enlighten your heart, and restore sight to your blind eyes. You have to read this book, then maybe, just maybe, then you can understand. Uh, Now, something's off there. When someone tells you that you can't understand something until you've read a particular book that's not the Bible, That's called building your house on shifting sands. The opinions of man, they change like the seasons, but the word of God endures forever. And we must vigorously pray that the Lord keeps us from adding to the sufficient foundation of his word. So books can be helpful and they can be informative, but the Bible is enough. And here's how. Number one, the scriptures give us the sufficient standard of unity. And number two, the scriptures give us the sufficient equipment for unity. As a standard for everything, including unity, including racial reconciliation, the scriptures are enough. They show us clearly what righteousness looks like and by implication what unrighteousness looks like. 
Psalm 119 is the longest chapter of the Bible, and the entire thing is about how awesome God's word is. In verses 7 through 10, King David, he rejoices at the perfection of God's word. He writes this, listen along. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Mm. The word of God is delicious and it is precious and it is perfect and right. So you see, there is nothing wiser that we could do than to build our foundation and our unity upon the words of God and the words of Christ. That's why Jesus said that everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock, Matthew 7, 24. So the scriptures give us the good, righteous standard of God. If we're going to have a conversation about seeking unity between all peoples or about racial reconciliation, we must start with the scriptures because the scriptures also give us the sufficient standard, even of unity. The standard that we see of unity in scripture is incredibly high. And I wish we could spend an entire sermon just talking about what that standard looks like, and maybe we will in the future. Uh, But to give it in brief, throughout the scriptures, you see God's plan unfolding to bring all peoples to himself. Not all people, by the way, but all peoples, uh, people groups. He wants people from all families of the earth to worship him and to be blessed in his son. He wants us to fight for and maintain this unity. And I want to give you a clear picture of that. But first, before we can even talk about that, We need to first get clear on the basics before we can go that deep. So uh, we're just talking about the sufficiency of God's gifts, and then we can go deeper in the future. But let me move on. So the, the, the gift of his word is also the sufficient equipment for the work of unity. So as far as looking for equipment to fight for unity, to strengthen unity, or to maintain unity, the scriptures are enough. In 2 Timothy 3, Paul is, Tim, is, is encouraging Timothy for the fight in the last days. And he, he finishes off what he's saying to him, not by encouraging Timothy to equip himself with some new books he should read. He doesn't give him a list of speakers to listen to. Instead, he encourages him to carry on in the sacred writings. So in 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17, Paul writes this to Timothy. As for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Now listen to this part. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Complete, equipped for every good work. As equipment for every good work, the scriptures are enough. Revelation twelve eleven says this, they, the church, have conquered him, Satan, by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. For they loved not their lives even unto death. We testify not our own thoughts or ideas, but what we have seen and what we have heard from the Father, just like Christ, just like Paul, we have heard and we have seen, and we've heard and seen most clearly in the scriptures. So how much more powerful and effective it is, think about it, to direct people to the words of the living God. So let us boldly testify of what God has said as equipment for unity. The scriptures are God's sufficient communication. That's why in looking for the answers of how is unity possible, we have to start with that gift. We have to start in the word, in the scriptures. They communicate all the info that we need. It is enough. 
Uh, however, the scriptures are not enough. Sounds like I'm saying a paradox here in a way it's not really. I'm not. Just think about it. The scriptures are not enough when it comes to actually creating unity. You can know the standard and you can have the equipment and still look around and find that you do not have unity. It's like what Paul said when he faced when he was faced with the perfect standard of the law. He said, the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. That's Romans 7, 14. He said, I have the desire to do what is right. He had been given a will to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. So the scriptures are sufficient for the purpose of supplying us the standard of righteousness and the equipment for righteousness, but they're not sufficient to make us righteous or to give us the experience of righteousness. And that righteousness, that, could, that goes on to unity. Uh, that's why God had to give us a couple other gifts. And the second gift that God gives us to make unity possible is his son. He is the sufficient vessel for unity between all peoples. So look at verse 2 of our text, 1 Corinthians. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. In other translations, it says that Paul determined to know nothing except Christ. Paul he only had one item on the menu, and that was the gospel. Why was that? Wasn't he sensitive to the, to the demographics he was reaching? Wasn't he offering other culturally appropriate solutions? Well, no. <laughs> Oddly enough, because he knew that Christ is sufficient, even for the purpose of reconciling people to each other. The gift of God's Son is a sufficient vessel for unity between all peoples. But hardly anyone knows it nowadays, right? Back then, that was, the, that was the perfect solution to the toils, the struggles between Greeks and Jews, Romans and Jews, Greeks and Romans. Uh, but hardly anyone knows it today because, <coughs> oh, okay. I knew that was coming a while ago, and it finally came. All right. But hardly anyone <laughs> Let's move on. Hardly anyone knows it because people are often found turning to other things to achieve what Christ has already achieved. That's why no one knows. I heard Dr. Tony Evans, uh, he used a nursery rhyme to convey this idea. Maybe you heard of my friend Humpty Dumpty, right? Uh, it was said of him, Humpty Dumpty, he sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again, right? It's a sad tale when you think about it, a very short one. You see, when Humpty Dumpty fell, he didn't turn to his family or his friends, his community, his church, or his God. He turned to the federal government to fix him, right? But even the decrees and policies of the king even all the combined resources of the king, all of his horses, all of his men combined, they could not solve Humpty's brokenness. So I, I'm not saying that you should never seek justice through the channels of human institutions or government, but they're just not good enough for repairing the breaches that exist between the peoples. There is no perfect human institution for achieving unity. In fact, reconciliation, it's not even something for us to achieve. It is already achieved. Reconciliation has already been achieved in the one divine human vessel, Christ. Here's how. Number one, the body of Christ is sufficient for reconciliation. And number two, the body of Christ is sufficient to bring all peoples into one. So first, the body of Christ is sufficient for reconciliation. So how can there be true deep unity if there is not reconciliation? If there is not forgiveness for wrongs done, if there is not the removal of all forms of guilt, if there's not healing of old wounds, 
All of this is accomplished in the blood and the body of Christ, both forgiveness and healing. Isaiah, he prophesied that the Christ's bodily destruction would achieve all of this. In Isaiah 53, I'm going to read selections from there, starting in verse 5. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. Verse 6, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Verse 10, his soul makes an offering for guilt. Verse 11, out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Verse 12, he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. As Paul puts it, in Christ Jesus, you who are once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. Ephesians 2.13. In Christ's bodily sacrifice, we find the sufficient vessel for reconciliation with God. We find forgiveness of sins, the removal of guilt and shame, and healing for our corruption. So what does this have to do with unity with each other? Well, if we can be reconciled to God in Christ, then we can certainly be reconciled to one another in Christ. In fact, if we wish for the gospel to be applied to us in Christ, we must also apply it to others, especially the brethren. Ephesians 4.32 says this, Be kind and tenderhearted to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. And 1 John 1, 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus' his son cleanses us from all sin. The picture here, I don't know if you're seeing it, it's of the Lord's Supper, communion or communion, Right? Among other things, it's a picture of the unity that we have together in Christ as brothers and sisters. Paul says as much in 1 Corinthians 10, 16 through 17. He says this, the cup of blessing that we bless is it not a participation in the blood of Christ. The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of the one bread. We all participate in this gospel together, all of us, recipients of grace upon grace. We receive forgiveness from God through the rending and tearing of Christ's body. And as our sins toward us, toward God, are forgiven by Christ's blood and body, so we can forgive others. And so our wounds can be healed. So the body of Christ, it is sufficient for reconciliation between all peoples. Second, the body of Christ is the sufficient vessel for bringing all peoples into one. Here, I'm talking about his body, the church, his beloved bride. In Christ, God has given a body to unite all peoples together into one. Paul writes about this in Ephesians chapter 2. In the context He's talking specifically about a racial distinction. He's talking about how the Gentiles, who were all non-Jews, were alienated from the blessings of Israel and the covenants of promise without hope, without God, but the body of Christ bridged the gap. So starting at Ephesians 2 verse 13 says this, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has torn down the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing in his flesh the law of commandments and decrees. He tore down the dividing wall of hostility between these two people and brought them together into one. 
Halfway through verse 15, he did this to create in himself one new man out of the two. Do you get that? He did this to create in himself one new man out of the two different people groups. He put them together, thus making peace and reconciling both of them to God in one body through the cross, by which he extinguished their hostility. Man, I mean, th that is just the one of the best passages. We're talking about how the scriptures are sufficient. That is one of the best passages. How can you hope for a unity or reconciliation deeper than what is in that passage? There is no, play there is no body of reconciliation that exists outside of Christ, that comes anywhere near the body of Christ. So meditate on these words. The peoples of the earth, they are all made one. Their hostilities and distinctions are extinguished. They are reconciled. They are made one in Christ, into one body. Peace is made between the peoples of the earth and the body of Christ. In the church, we are made one. You are not your own. This is the implication. But you belong to one another. There is no deeper relationship. No people more spiritually unified. No family with blood thicker. We are one in Christ. Christ built his church. He said, I will build my church. And so he has. And through his body, he blesses all the families of the earth. Just like he promised Abraham in Genesis 12, 3. So there is no more perfect vessel for reconciliation in this world. We're not going to make one better than Christ. Praise God. It's like this. Think about it like this. If a married couple has a fight, they don't get married again. That's not the solution they typically think of. They're already married, right? They have only to remember their covenant vows to delight and glory in their oneness, to fight against division, to strengthen their unity, and to cultivate intimacy. So it is with Christ's body and with reconciliation between the peoples in Christ. The work of Christ has already achieved it. The covenant is already there. The marriage is already done. Humpty Dumpty was put together by Christ in the situation, right? So the body of Christ, it is the sufficient vessel for bringing all people into one. All peoples. Um, the gift of Christ, it is sufficient. You are made righteous in Christ. You can also experience righteousness and unity through the third gift, his Holy Spirit. It's not just an identity statement, but it goes into our experiences. It must. The third gift God gives us to make unity possible is the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is the sufficient energy for unity between all peoples. Look at verse 4 of our text in 1 Corinthians. My speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. The gift of the Spirit provides the sufficient energy for every good work. Paul believed it, and that's what energized his ministry. Paul wrote this about his work in Colossians 1, 28-29. He said this, Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all my energy. Oh, wait a minute. Did I read that wrong? For this I toil, struggling with all his energy. Okay, with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. I mean, it, it almost sounds like a paradox a little bit at first, doesn't it? Because he says he's toiling for this purpose of, of presenting everyone mature in Christ. He's toiling for this, but he's toiling with all the energy of God. How often do we toil in our own energy? How often do we fight for unity and righteousness with our own strength. That is merely to have a form of godliness, but to deny its power. 2 Timothy 3.5 Be sure of this. The gospel of self-empowerment is a false gospel in that it denies the essential work of the Holy Spirit 
in the Christian. That's not to say that you shouldn't do anything, obviously. You must do, actually, justice, and you must love mercy. But you find that you can't, right? You find that you are not able. You do not do what you want to do because the law is spiritual, and I am not. We must worship him in spirit and in truth, which is why God gives us the gift of his spirit. So here's why the gift of the Spirit is sufficient or enough. One, the Holy Spirit provides power for unity. And two, the Holy Spirit provides the experience of unity. So first, the Holy Spirit provides power for unity. We already kind of said this through what we saw in Paul in Colossians 1, 28 through 29. But I'll just include one more passage to show this. In 1 Peter 4, 11, which says that whoever serves should serve as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. And why is that? Why? Well, it says in the next part of the verse, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. God's energy wasn't just for Paul to work through. God's strength is for all believers, for every good work. This promise of the Spirit, that you can receive the Spirit, is not just for the people that were hearing the Apostles' message. It's not just for their children, but for all who would believe to the ends of the earth. Acts 2, Joel 2, look at it. Um, God's strength is for all believers, for every good work. In truth, God's power has to energize every good work. Why is that? So that in everything, God gets the glory because he is worth it. The Holy Spirit provides power for unity as he energizes all our activities. Second, the Holy Spirit provides the experience of unity. Paul challenged the Ephesians to experience unity by the, by the Spirit in Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 6. He says this, Walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Then Paul talks about those gifts that the one Lord gives us by his spirit in verse 11 and he gave the apostles the prophets the evangelists the shepherds the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ You see, we attain to the experience of unity in the body by using our unique gifts from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit provides the experience of unity through unique gifts to the members of Christ's body. He energizes the work and gives gifts for the work. So you see, only when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon us will we be able to agree with Christ in saying this, what he quotes from the prophet Isaiah in chapter 61. The spirit of the Lord of God, of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is why the Spirit of the Lord God was upon Christ and why he rests upon us only when he is upon us. So we need to spend time on our knees seeking power from on high, seeking the work of the Spirit for unity in our church and between all peoples because the Spirit is the sufficient energy for unity between all peoples. And as we have this promise, knock and it shall be given to you, ask and you shall receive. 
And how much more will his father give the spirit to those who ask him? So I join with Paul in praying for you, New King Church, and for anybody else who is listening. May God, according to the riches of his glory, grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, Ephesians 3.16. And may you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, Colossians 1.11. I mean, truly, church, it, it is true that God has given us all the gifts that we need. We couldn't hope for more. We couldn't hope for more. He has given us his testimony, the sufficient communication about unity. He has given us his son, the sufficient vessel for unity. And he has given us his spirit, the sufficient energy for unity. His gifts truly are enough. Let us live in those gifts. Let us work through those gifts. Let those gifts work in us, church. So let me pray for us that God would do this work for us. Heavenly Father, we glory in your gifts. I pray that you just help us as a church to embrace the gifts that you have given us. Let us be changed, Father, by the knowledge of your gifts, and let us be changed by the experience of them. And it's for all this that we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Oh,
Forever.